all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But God commandeth his love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that's a remarkable statement. All you have to do is call on him, friends. To call upon the Lord means to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. be in Romans. Actually, we'll be in Romans chapter 3, verses 22 to 26. Actually, that's not right. Actually, we're going to be in 21 to 31. But why I brought up 22 to 36. Actually, before we do anything, let's pray. Father God, Lord, uh, here we are, Lord, this morning, gathering, Lord, gathering together as a body of what? A body of Jesus followers, a body of Christ, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that's in everyone's heart. That's, that's why they're here, to come together as one in unity, to assemble together, to be with you, to be with the Father, with the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that you would lead us this morning, Lord, as you always do, Lord, to give us guidance and comfort and, and, and assurance this morning, that your word is true, that your word is divine, that your word brings glory to you. And I pray that through us this morning that we can walk out of here, Lord, with something on our hearts that would change. Maybe something would change. Maybe there's something on our hearts that needs to be changed this morning. And I pray, Lord, that the Word would do that. The sword of the Spirit, Lord, would cut to the heart, cut to the marrow this morning, Lord, of each and every one of us sitting here worshiping you and praising you this morning and, and also, Lord, a gathering in your name. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen, amen. amen. Let me, I gotta put my glasses on, I can't see. So here we are, right? and I, I want you to understand something here. In Romans, we're, in Romans, look at Romans 22 to 26. And again, we're gonna be in Romans 3, chapter, chapter 3, 21 to 31. But look in verse 23, how often Paul, what he does here, he uses the word faith, right? And we're gonna see, we see that, right? Faith. And in Romans 23, it can be read, right? He says, remember this, for all have sinned, and they're constantly coming short of the glory of God. We've been hearing some heavy-duty stuff, how bad really this whole situation is, not just here, but for mankind in general. And Paul's just laying that down, that none are righteous, not one. None of us are not even righteous. And Paul introduces several terms, and I want you to understand these terms because they're very, and they're not really complicated, but they're important for the Christian. They're important for us as in our walk to know who we are and what we believe, and why we are who we are. And here, one of the really important words here is justified. Maybe you want to write that down. That word justified, and that's being what? Justified is being declared righteous in God's sight. Boy, do we want that, right? Declared righteous in God's sight through the merits of who? Through the merits of Jesus. That's all justified is. I say that's all. That's pretty big. And we're secure, which is the awesome thing. We're secure in a position in Jesus Christ 
before the throne of God. Now see all those things we were talking about, the, the heavy duty stuff, you are secure right before the throne of God because you're justified. Very important word. And justification is God's righteousness, and the word we see here is imputed, which actually it means, what that means? It means faith. In, right through faith, you're imputed. God's righteousness is imputed and put to your account this morning. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, these are good news. This is the good news this morning. And we are made holy. You see, all those negative, all those things that Paul was talking about, right? In chapter, here, I'll read some of them. I, I'll give you a quick reminder. So all these positive and awesome things you're going to hear this morning where he said, right? Remember chapter 3, he said, all have sinned. Chapter 9, he, uh, verse 9, he says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. Remember these words from last week? There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They all have turned aside. That's an indictment. Paul's given this heavy-duty indictment. There is none. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit, the poison of asp under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Remember those words from last week? I, that was hard. Those words are hard. You know, when you walk out of here, you go, oh, man, that's heavy-duty stuff here. Paul's talking. And am I? I'm not righteous. But yes, now we go forward in this scripture here from 21 to 31, where he says, look at that word here. He starts off on verse 21. He says, but now. See, now it changes. Everything changes from where we just came. And now Paul says that justification, right? We're made holy. We're made, and here's the thing about justification. You're made or live, to live out your life, your daily life, your everyday life, more and more in who? Image Jesus. You become more like Jesus. That's, your, that's who we are, to become more like Jesus, to live your life that way, to live it out, because you now are justified. You're made holy because of Jesus. And then the next important word here is to understand is redemption. You have justify. You have redemption. This is Christian here. You're, this is what redemption is. Deliverance from sin and its penalties. Ah, that's awesome, isn't it? You're delivered. You're clean. You're wiped. Your, your slate's wiped clean because you're now justified in the blood of Christ. Because there was a payment for that. For your justification and for our redemption, there was a price paid for that. And that price was what? Jesus' blood on the cross. Never forget that. The blood, of Christ, the blood of Christ on the cross. And then the next word is very, this is a good word here too, propitiation. Say that three times fast. Propitiation. And that's quite, what is that? All that is, is I say all that is, is Christ's sacrifice is now has satisfied the law. Remember we've been talking about the law? Well, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, go always to the cross, has now satisfied God's holy law. Didn't get rid of the law, but it's now satisfied. And it's made possible, the awesome thing here, is it's making it possible for God to forgive sinners, which we all are, which we all aren't in some sort of way, right? We're wiped clean. And the sinners are remain just to himself, to pour out ourselves to the Lord. God's, this is important, God's justice, because God's, God's God of justice it has to be justified, has been satisfied. Praise the Lord. Amen this morning? Because now, now God, and this is really important, now God can look with kindness on us instead of, he couldn't look at us before as sinners, right? We had to be justified by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. But now he can look at us in kindness and grace. But he can also now look and send us out into a lost world to preach the good news. Because of this. Romans 3, chapter 3, verse 24, he says, We are justified freely by his, what? Grace. Grace. Not by works. Not by works or good intentions, or, or gifts to one another, or prayers, or prayers are good, but freely by His grace alone. And that's it. That's it. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it, because that's where it all comes from. But freely by His grace alone. And in this letter that we're reading this morning, Paul explains how God can be both just and the justifier. That's in Romans chapter 3, verse 26. And like I said a couple seconds ago, 
the answer for you and for me is always the cross. To look at the cross. Because when Jesus died, what did he do? We know this, you know this, Christian. He bore our sins, didn't he? And what did he do? His own body he put up there and thus paid the price. He paid the price of, that God's law demanded. That God's law demanded. But he rose again. But he rose again. And he's alive this morning. He's alive this morning in you, in me, in this building, through the Holy Spirit. He's alive and he's able to save and remember this, as you walk out of here this morning, and you may have people on your hearts this morning, or you may bump into someone this week that, I don't know, it could be a, a God-appointed situation. Remember this, he's able to save all. That's the key word, he's able to save all. So we go move on now here into this Romans chapter 3, 21 to 31. And really, this is what we see here. This is the good news. In these verses, we're going to go into these are the good news. This is the gospel, what you're hearing. These are powerful this morning. That the good news, justification by faith. That's all it is, justification by faith. And this is kind of almost kind of comes to a, it's almost come, comes to a point where Paul's having this great conclusion to this chapter. And it is. This revelation of righteousness that we all have. Look at the opening words of verse 21. I said a few minutes ago, you could circle those words because he says, but now. So he changes. Something's changing now. Paul's saying, all those things I was talking about. Oh yeah, that's true. That's who man is. None of us are righteous. Not one. But he says, but now. He's going to give us and this is after, this, I mean, that was, those verses, those few, chapter 2 and 3 were pretty tough verses. Those verses that were given to us before. But now comes God's word of relief. Aren't you in the mood for relief? <laughs> I'm in the mood for relief. I'm telling you, on Sunday, they're, they're, I, I'll, be, I'll be real. Sometimes, you know, you go through the week and you're dragging, you're dragging sometimes. And you go, you got to do this and you got to do that. And sometimes you don't feel like it. And sometimes you're... There's circumstances that are kind of pecking at you all week. And you just say, oh, Lord, I, I can't. But when Sunday comes and I come and I'm with you guys and we're together, I get energized. I, I, get, I say, well, that, that's not me. I go, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit in me. And I pray that for all of us this morning, that the Holy Spirit's lifting you up this morning. And we see here these words of relief. And it's God's, and this is it, guys. It's a total, it's an answer, it's the total answer to man's failure. The total answer. And Paul's, he's concluded this description of what humanity is like. We saw that. And as God sees it, because remember this, nothing, remember we talked about this, nothing is hidden from God's eyes. Nothing. Not our thoughts, not our hearts, not our intent or our motives. Nothing's hidden. Nothing's hidden. You can't hide. You can't go in that closet and hide in there. God even this sees right in there. We see clearly that no one can make, make it right in God's sight. But the ver words from verses 10 to 12 told us that, right? Right? There's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who searches for God. All have turned away and together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. That's Romans chapter 3, verse 10 to 12. But now, Paul says, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law, this is verse 21, has made, been made to known to which the law and the prophets testify. See, this is God's great nevertheless, if you will. Like, nevertheless, in the face of our failure, as man's failure, as sinners. It's, and it's kind of like guiding us through this section here. Look at verse 21. Look at verse 21. You have, what you have is God's answer to man's failure. And then in verses 22 to 24, what does he do? He tells us how that gift of righteousness is obtained. And then verses 25 to 26, he tells us how and why, how it works. And then verses 27 to 31, he tells us the results that are going to, if we follow this, are given. How, what the results of all this are. And look together at verse 21. This great statement. And it is a great statement. One, I think it's one of the great statements of the gospel right here. Where he says, ready? Verse 21. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has made it known to which the law and the prophets testify. It's repetition. Because you've got to hear this over and over again. Because this is the gospel. This is the good news. This is what Paul elsewhere calls 
the glorious gospel of the blessed God. He says that in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. And this good news that God has to announce to us, even this morning, this good news to walk out here this morning, which consists of this gift that God gives us. And it's a wonderful gift, the righteousness of God himself. Because without the righteousness of God, let's, we might as well walk out the door. We're finished. We have to be seen in the righteousness of God. And we'll get to that. That word righteousness is, it's kind of, righteousness is almost kindly highly, I think it's misunderstood a lot of times in our world today because it's often associated with, what, what's righteousness all, all, often associated with? Behavior, your behavior, right? People behaving in the right way, right? Oh, he's a righteous person, he's behaving in the right way. We say that they're behaving righteously. In this book of Romans, though, righteousness does not directly touch on behavior. That might sound queer, but wait a second here. It's not what you do, it's what you are. You see, that's what it is. Look inside of yourself this morning. It's not what you do, it's but who you are. Who you are. And that's even more important because your behavior stems from what you are. Does that make sense? It should, if you really think about it. The gift Paul's talking about here, and it is a gift, this gift from God, this wonderful gift from God, is that, that of a righteous standing before him. We can stand before God now in righteousness. And the gospel announces to us that it is given to us, that's been given to us, a gift. And according to the gospel, you can't earn it. You can't earn this gift. It's given to us. It's given to us. Now that's good news. That's good news, isn't it? And, what a, and that's a wonderful statement because the gospel, this gospel, the gospel of Jesus is dealing with something, I believe, tremendously significant. And it does not only have to do with what happens when you die, right? Because we all think about, oh, what happened? I'm going to be with Jesus. It has to do with this. And maybe you felt this in your heart sometimes or maybe even in your head or going through different things. That we have this need, don't you have this need to know that God loves you? Don't you really deep down inside? Like that God does love you. And that we're, that you're acceptab acceptable to him in his sight. What a wonderful thing. That God loves you and you're acceptable in his sight. That we have standing. That you, Christian, you follower of Jesus, you have standing and value and worth to him. Maybe, maybe you're struggling with some things this morning you know, about yourself or some of the things you might be going through. But just remember this, you're acceptable in his sight and your righteousness to, with, with Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ on that cross. We have standing and value and worth to him. And what God is offering is a gift of righteousness. This is really important. It's his own perfect righteousness. And, and it can't be improved upon. You can't improve upon that righteousness that we have by faith in Jesus Christ. By faith in Jesus Christ. He gives us, and I pray this is your heart, He gives you a sense of worth and acceptance. Not of this world, but of Jesus Christ and what He's done for us at the cross. And it could be, you know what? This is how I feel in my heart. There's nothing better there's no better news to us this morning than that. By faith in Christ, he gives us a sense of worth and acceptance. When all things are going bad, and when all things maybe you're feeling low, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He accepts you. You're worthy. Paul adds two things to this. Paul adds two things to this. As to make it kind of, he's going to make it clear to us. Paul's going to make it clear to us. First, he says this. This righteousness is apart from the Remember this? Remember the scripture? The righteousness is apart from the law. Remember we talked about the law? It's not something that you earn. It's a gift. You can't earn it by doing your best. Oh, I'm going to do my best. It has nothing to do with it. To be pleasing to God. But and anybody, and if you approach God, and I've seen this many times, sometimes even in Christians, if you're approaching God on the terms of, I got to do better, and I got to do my best, and I got to, you're going to fail. You failed already. You don't have to do that. You've been, given, you've been given what? By grace of God, you've been given that gift. And there's no one, look, uh, there is no one or no way anyone can measure up to God's standards. So forget it. There's no one. Nevertheless, nevertheless though, God has found a way to give us that gift. 
I'm going to keep emphasizing this because I want you to go out of here all pumped up, feeling good in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit this morning. It's something we can't end. And then secondly, Paul says this. He says, it's witnessed by the law, the scriptures, that's what the scriptures tell us. It's witnessed by the law and the prophets. He did make it known. God did make it known. This DF, right? Jesus Christ. He did make it known. He made it known in the law. And it's found in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. If you know your Bible, if you read from Genesis to Revelation, the law, what the law did, it gave testimony to the righteousness and the gift of God. That's what the law did. Providing, what did it do? How did it do it? By what did they do? They provided sacrifices to God. That was part of it. See, the Jews knew this. They knew somehow that they... The Jews knew deep down in their heart that they didn't measure up to God's standards. So the law, right, which they had the law, provided a system for them of offerings and sacrifices. And that could be brought and offered on an altar. And actually, when you think about that, if you really kind of picture that in your head, that's almost kind of a picture of the death of Jesus, that sacrifice and offering that they were doing. That whole sacrifice, actually, that whole sacrificial system of the Old Testament is really a witness to the one who's coming, who came, the Lamb of God. That was that, that, that's what that was a witness of. And it tells us that in John chapter 1, verse 29, who takes away what? The sins of the world. The prophets, right? He talks about the prophets. They knew the names, they knew all, you know all the names in the Old Testament, the ones who had faith, Abraham, Moses, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and there's plenty of others. Not only talked about this gift, they did, but they experienced it themselves. In one of the Psalms, if you read one of the Psalms, that we'll, we'll read, and actually we'll read it in the next chapter, David's quoted as saying this, Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. That's a powerful verse right there. And it says, and this is the most important part, that this is in Psalm 32.1, whose sins are covered. See, our sins are covered. I'm not telling you to go out and sin. <laughs> don't do it. Well, that'd be the Holy Spirit will tell you to do that. Paul says this, it's clearly explained here and made readily available to us at the cross of Jesus. And I'm going to emphasize that because I think some churches and some, they're getting away from that. The cross, they're getting away from the cross, getting away from the blood of Jesus. So as Paul goes on further in this discussion, in this next part, he tells us how to obtain this gift. This is for us. Get this, take this into your heart this morning. So maybe you know, this, this gift you can explain to someone else who needs to hear the good news. And how do you get it? How do you get this gift? Well, here's Paul's answer. Look at verses 22 to 24. Here's the answer. How do you get this gift? How does he say? He says, the righteousness from God comes through faith. In who? Jesus Christ. To who? To all. Not some. Not, not this group or that group. To all who what? Believe. There's a gospel right there. The righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And then he goes on to say, there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified freely by what? Here it is the word again. Grace, by his grace, through, this is the important word again, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Wow. There you go. You want to circle some verses right there. Romans 22, uh, verse, chapter 3, verse 22 to 24. That's telling me this. There is, there's one way expressed here in four different aspects. Listen to this. But only one way through faith in Christ. That's the only way. That's the only way. If somebody tells you something different, you, you, you got to go, you got to walk, you got to set them straight. Set them straight. So look, look how Paul... His answer almost kind of centers almost immediately on the person of the Savior. Isn't that true? Look, right, he tells us that right there, right, through faith in Jesus Christ. Not, not just in his teaching, not in Jesus' te just his teaching, but in his person, who he was. And it's by faith, it's by faith Christ himself that you came into this standing this morning. You can stand, you can stand there in faith this morning that he that you proclaim this in your heart, he's the Savior. He is the one who saves us. And I know you guys know all this stuff, but this is, you got to understand, this Romans is vitally important for us to know the things that God wants us to know so we can stand in this world and tell people the truth. Because this is the truth we're, get, we're hearing this morning. This isn't all made up here. 
And so this gift that he's talking about, about involves a, a relationship, and it's always about the relationship with Jesus, right, to a living person. And that is, and that means, that means this, right, and I, I think it's happened probably to you already if you're a follower of Jesus, there's got to come a point in your life where you've got to open, you open your heart and you open your life to Jesus. There's got to come a point where you can't keep closing them out, especially if you're a follower of Jesus right now. Don't close them out. There's got to come a time where you open your, you just open your life to him. Everything. Open your life to him. He already knows, but open your life to him. Open your life to Jesus Christ. Because when you ask him to be what he offers, what he offers this is to be your Lord. Your Lord. Your Lord and Savior. And later in this letter, Paul's going to say something really profound. He's going to say, listen, he says, if you confess with your mouth, you know this scripture, Jesus is Lord, so there it is, see? There it is. Jesus is Lord, and believe where? In your heart that God, what? Raised him from the dead. You will be what? Saved. saved. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This morning you will be saved. And that's another term kind of, if you want to, we go back to this word again, another term for this gift, if you will, is righteousness. And Paul tells us that in chapter 10, as we go forward, chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, he says, For it is with your heart, it's always with the heart, right, that you believe and are justified. Ah, so there it is. You, if you believe in your heart, you are justified. And it is, with, it is with your mouth that you confess and you are saved. Jesus said in the book of Revelation, Jesus said in the book of Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, what, of your heart? Here's, here's what he says. I will come in to him. That's you. That's me. That's someone walking down the street right now. Jesus can walk, come into that person's life just like that and have a relationship with them. If they open, them, open their heart, confess with their mouth, receive him into their life. Here it is. I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. That's one day going to be us with the Lord Jesus one day when we're out of here. There's no other way. There is no other way. No one can, there's no way found in all the earth. And I know there is so many, you can, there are so many different things that are coming at you all kinds of different ways. How to, people are coming up all different ways. How to, whoa, what's the afterlife? Is there reincarnation? Is there, is there this? Is there that? No, there's no one, there's one way. And that way is through Jesus Christ. That can bring men and that, Jesus Christ, here's what I think in my heart Jesus does for me. He brings a sense of value to us in that, that standing in God's, God's sight and the worth that, and the love. And that's the most important word, and the love before him. Secondly, Paul straight, he, what he does here now, Paul's, he's going to stress this fact here that all who believe are saved. See, we're talking about the gospel here, aren't we? Which we try to, at the end of each service, we try to proclaim the gospel message to someone, send it out to someone to, to receive Jesus in their heart. You're saved when you personally believe, right? You guys believe that. And that faith, because now this is all about faith, faith comes to a place in your heart where it takes that gift that God offers. That's what, that's what faith is. You can say, well, I'm going to receive this. I might not know all about it, but I'm going to take it in faith. And what, and here's, here's always, what, what good is a gift if you don't take it, right? And that gifts, you know, gifts can be offered, right? Gifts get, get offered to you, but they can't be used until they're taken. And that's, you know, if God's given us the gift right now, he's given you the gift of salvation, you know, use that gift. Use that gift. Don't just, don't just mindlessly walk through the rest of this life going, ah, oh, it's okay. No, use the gift God has given you, has put on your heart, this gift of salvation. And when that occurs, look, you're, that gift really becomes effective. God was, be, you say, well, how is God, how God, I want God to use me. I want God, God's, God wants to use you. God wants to use you. Use the gift he's given you, the gift of salvation. Because then you become an effective, I say proselytizer, but you become an effective evangelical, evangelist. The third aspect here that he describes on how we obtain this gift is in the phrase, here's what he says, justified freely by his grace. Do you see what that says? Justified freely by his grace? He says, this, it is God who does this. No one else. It's God who does this. And if you try to say this, that there's anything that you have to do or man has to do to be justified, you're going to destroy the gift. You'll mess up the gift. Because it's always all of God. Everything. Everything is all of God. 
We are justified. Good word this morning. We're declared righteous. Good word this morning. We're declared worth in God's sight. Awesome word this morning. By what? His grace. You guys good with that? You tracking here? <laughs> yeah. No? But if you add things to it, then we just had a baptism. We, if you add baptism to it or, or church membership or anything else like that, you're going to destroy kind of the grace of God. You're going to, if you're going to put more emphasis on all those things, you'll, you'll take away from the grace of God. And it's kind of, it should be a freely and completely and wholly understanding that it is God who saves us. Amen this morning? We don't contribute a thing. We don't contribute a thing. You may think so sometimes. There's a hymn. I found this hymn. It's pretty cool. It says, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. I'll say that again. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Cling to the cross this morning. Cling to the cross this morning. That's one, you know what, that's one, I think that's a beautiful way of kind of expressing this truth we're talking about this morning. And the last word in this section is this. He says this, through the redemption that came by Jesus, by Christ Jesus. Here, that is this. Christ is the one, only Jesus is the one who accomplished something that works of redemption. See, Jesus takes care of that redemption. So here... You're kind of, Paul is kind of telling us here, through the redemption that came from Jesus Christ, here's what Paul is doing, us, doing to us. He's bringing us face to face with the cross. He's bringing us face to face with the cross, with the death of Jesus. And that, here, this wonderful apostle, he's kind of underlining this fact here. And you, sometimes you find like Christianity that doesn't emphasize the cross. And if you don't, if, you, if you're following that or that type of Christianity, you're going to probably get led down the wrong path somewhere down the road. I've seen that. I've seen it too many times. You're listening. What you're listening to then, you're listening to another gospel then. You're listening to another gospel, which is not the true gospel. The real gospel is based upon the redemption which Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. That, that's it. That's the real gospel. Paul gets this brief explanation here of how and why this redemption works as we do come to an end here pretty, pretty soon. Look at verse 25. How. Here we see how is found in the opening words here. And he says, God, and why in the verse that follow. Watch. God presented him as a sacrifice. This is verse 25. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. There it is again, the gospel. He did, not demonstra he did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate, this is powerful, he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just, verse 26 too also, be just and the one who justifies the man who has faith in Jesus. Give real, uh, here, give careful attention here to these words. Really, give careful attention to these words because this is the heart of the gospel. This is the heart of gospel, what we just read here, that here's what it is. It's a ground for assurance. You know, you know that word? This is a ground for assurance. We all need, don't we need, sometimes we need assurance that, you know, you're going down the right path or you're doing the right thing. I need to be assured of the, you know, I'm, I'm following the certain way of doing things the right way. A lot of people think this, that even... And I see this sometimes with Christians. They struggle with that. They struggle with their assurance and who they are in Jesus Christ. They question it. And it's okay. You want to question it. But here, Paul's telling us this, that, you know, rest upon the fact that we, the words that you just read, the words that you have in that book are true. You have to believe that in your heart, that these words are, are, are fact. They're true. So they're filled often with sometimes this struggle of we have doubts and uncertainty. I get that. And sometimes even despite of the word of God, that's even in front of us, right? Isn't that a paradox when you think about it? God gives us the truth, and yet sometimes we struggle with it. How is that? I always question myself about that sometimes. I, look, pay, pay attention here what Paul's argument here is, kind of, sort of, because this is the answer to the struggle. Here's the answer to the struggle. First, he says that God has accomplished a propitiatory propitiatory sacrifice. God, what he did was present Jesus as a sacrifice. 
He's a substitute for us. God substituted Jesus for us. A sacrifice for what? Of atonement for our sins through faith in his blood. There it is, the gospel again. And these words, sacrifice of atonement, are really kind of translating into a single word, the Greek word, halisteron, which is, some people say, oh, that's the mercy, God. it's the mercy seat. It's the mercy seat of God. In the, in the Septuagint, it's, it says it's the, it's the mercy seat of God. But I want you to understand this meaning before we close, because this is the heart of the gospel. Propitiation. Propitiation is what, and I, I kind of went down this road with, after going through a couple of different studies. Propitiation, it's God substituting, putting Jesus in our place, but it also does this. It awakens love. It does. It awakens love. Propitiation carries us an awakening of God's love toward us. Now, isn't that interesting? And I had to go down this path to try and get deeper into this. And what Paul is saying here that our sin has injured God, right? Sin has injured God. So God has been injured by sin. But, and our sin has hurt and injured God. It has. But justice demands that we be punished for that sin in some way. That's justice. And in the death of Jesus Christ, that punishment was accomplished. So there it is. You don't have to be, there's your assurance that that punishment for all your sins, for everything you've sinned in the past, present, and the future, the death of Jesus Christ took that punishment upon himself on that cross. For you. That's your assurance this morning that he did it. That God's justice was satisfied. You see, it had to be satisfied because he's a just God. In a way, it means that, that it paid, that God was paid the debt through Jesus Christ. So that no one longer, so that look, and maybe this is hard again to grasp, that you're that he no longer holds us to blame anymore. But that's not all Paul's saying here. The word means also this, that God's love has been awakened toward us because now we're justified by him. He can love us now. That sin has been taken away. And he reaches, God's reaching out to you this morning. I believe this in my heart. And he's reaching out to us in love this morning. In many ways, I don't know what you're thinking right now and hearing all these words, but God loves you. He's reaching into your heart because God now is, we can come to him and he can outpour his love to us because of the, being justified and the redemption that we have through the blood of the cross. And we have acceptance and value in his sight. That's what propitiation means. A substitute sacrifice to take the punishment of our sins. That is what the death of Jesus does this morning. It did satisfy God's justice, but it even went further. It awakened his love. Praise the Lord. And now he's ready to pour out this love to you and me, to us, to this world. Paul shows us why this had to happen. Look at the middle of verse 25. He said, he did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. What, what's he talking about here? What's he talking about? He's referring to all the past, the past centuries, all the past centuries when God apparently had done nothing about the wrongdoings of men. Right? He just let, him, let mankind go on, right? Didn't he? He let mankind go on. And we find people question that today, even like, whoa, why? Where's the God of justice? Where's your God of justice? How is that God just, he lets all these tyrants run around the earth and he, people rise up in this murder and mayhem and where's your God of justice? How can they let people live in poverty and squalor and filth? Where's your God of justice? Where is that justice? of God. Those questions, people come, you know, people say that, and you know, you got to be ready to answer that in love. We find, you want to we want to find the answers, read a lot of the Psalms. You'll find, you'll find a lot of answers in Psalms. And the last time, if you remember the last time God took care of mankind, when was it? The flood, right? Remember? The flood. That was the holy justice in that time where God took man, wiped them out. In response to what? The wickedness of men toward other men. God wiped out the whole human race. Except for eight people. The, actually, the flood, the flood was a testimony to God's sense of justice in some way. But there's never been, since that time, God's let mankind go on. Because we know, we went through the book of Daniel, remember? We know it's coming ahead. We know it's coming ahead. So the question arises this, and does God really care? Of course he does. 
David writes, why do the wicked flourish and the righteous suffer? Where is the God of justice? The cross settles that. The cross settles it. The cross says that God remains just. Always remember that. God is a just God. He poured out upon the head of... And I get... Sometimes I get choked up thinking about this. He poured out that... Your wrath, his wrath... On, for all of our sins, for all of mankind's sin, he poured it out on Jesus on the cross. He poured that all on Jesus on the cross. Because that's the wrath that man deserves. He didn't even lessen the punishment to his own son. He poured everything out on him. Everything, every sin you've ever committed, every sin you're going to commit, he poured it out on his only son. All of it. Not some of it. Not half of it, all of it. That's what I mean, it gets me choked up, that Jesus did that for me, for you. All of it was poured out on him. And that, that probably, you, you know, you've heard Jesus right on the cross where in Matthew 27 where he talks about, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know why he felt that? I believe in my heart. is that he felt this emptiness now, that he was separated from his father this emptiness, and he was now under the judgment of God. I think that's what he was experiencing on the cross because it was all poured out on him. Paul's argument is this, that he did it to demonstrate his justice, to be free to extend love. There it is, to us who deserve only his justice. That's the glory of the good news this morning, and that's where we'll end this morning. God loves us, and he's free now to act in your life every day, every minute, every hour. Don't you want that? He's freed you through the blood of Jesus this morning. I, would tell, I will end it here at verse 27 to 31, because this is, this is important. Paul gives us the results of this forgiveness. He says, when, look at verses 27 to 31, and we'll end here. When then is boasting? Is it excluded on that principle of that of observing the law? No, but of that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the, is God, the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Paul says yes, of the Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith, he's talking about Jew and Gentile there, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Paul says what? Not at all. Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. So Paul raises that question here, and he's just shown us this tremendous acceptance now that God gives us in Jesus Christ. And I will tell you this, it's not about, look, we don't go around bragging, we don't go around boasting, right? We just tell people about the love of Christ in our heart. Because there's no grounds for any of us, to any of us, to say, well, at least uh, I didn't do this or I didn't do that. I, I, I'm, I'm good, right? Remember we talked about that? The only ground of acceptance we have is the gift of grace. Amen? Amen. 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 And here I'll tell you this this morning. This is what we hear. You hear the gospel. And I'll tell you, and maybe I got a little excited this morning because those previous verses were tough to go through. This is exciting. This is assurance. This is the gift. This is grace. This is the love of God being poured out to us to pour out into the world. The love of Jesus. That's what you're hearing this morning. Go out. Walk out that door feeling in your heart that God loves you, that you're justified before him. You can now stand before him through the redemption of, the, of Jesus on the blood of the blood of Jesus on the cross this morning. Those are the things you can walk out of here and have assurance that you are saved. That you are now, when you take your last breath, you'll be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And for whatever time that is for each one of us, if it's we go together as a church or we go individually, hold on to those things this week. When life gets tough, when things get difficult, when maybe you're challenged with some scenario, whether it's a moral challenge or an immoral challenge, whatever it is, family, friends, your job, remember you have assurance through the blood of Jesus, the gift that God has given us, the grace of God. I pray that you believe that. And if that's someone out there this morning that heard that, you can have that relationship with Jesus. That, and I believe a lot of us here have that. A lot of people sitting in this 
this place right now are followers of Jesus Christ. And there may be someone right now, maybe that's shaky on it or doesn't understand a lot of it, but it's not that hard to understand. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. Why? Because of sin. We're all sinners. And what happened? He took that sin. They crucified him. They buried him. And then on the third day, he defeated death and rose. The resurrection. That's the good news this morning. That's the good news for us, for anyone out there. And it is about a relationship. It is about a relationship with Jesus. Because it's not about religion. It's not about, you know, we see the law. We talk about the law. Well, you know what? Jesus made the law alive in our hearts now. It's in our hearts. Because all the law did before it was condemned. We're not condemned anymore. We now have redemption. And if you want that relationship with Jesus, I ask you this. Just come. This said before we read that scripture. Jesus is knocking on the door. Well, he's knocking on your heart. He's knocking on, that's where it always comes, right? It's always on the heart. And if Jesus is knocking on your heart this morning, you know what? You can go to our website, ccberkeley.org. You can click on prayer requests, send your information. If you need a Bible, you know, if you want, my phone number's on our website. I'll give you a call. Whatever it is to talk about Jesus, talk about salvation, to talk about a hope that you can walk on this earth until you take your last breath and know that you're going to be with the Lord Jesus one day. For our struggle, the scripture says, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And the scripture says, therefore, take up the full armor of God, the belt. Paul said, having your loins girt with truth. In other words, learn the scriptures, learn the word of God. This is how we resist the devil. And then Paul said, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate was made of bronze backed with tough pieces of hide. And the breastplate of righteousness is what we get from Jesus Christ when we come to him as our Lord and Savior. Because our righteousness, our goodness is filthy rags in the sight of God. And we receive the breastplate of righteousness so that when the devil shoots his fiery darts, they can't penetrate that breastplate. And then thirdly, he says, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It means that you should have the peace of God in your heart. The serenity, the joy, the happiness that Christ gives should be in your heart. So that when troubles come, Satan will not be able to get close to you. And then fourthly, the Roman soldiers carried a shield. The scripture says, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. Satan is always shooting his missiles and his darts at us. We need the shield of faith. Intellectually, you cannot come to Christ alone because your mind has a veil over it put there by the devil. But when you come to Christ, your mind is illuminated by the Holy Spirit and the things that you didn't understand before, you now accept by faith and you put on that helmet, and that helmet protects you against the enemy. And then there's the sword, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's the offensive weapon. And the scripture says that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. When Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus used the sword, the Word of God. And then the seventh and the last thing is to pray. Pray without ceasing, said Paul. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. Check your armor. Is it in place?